17. And we're going to be talking today about the exclusive gospel. And I thought I would step out of 1 Corinthians today and just come back. And there's hopefully there'll be a lot of people watching in today to see what we're doing. And as we uh, get to Acts chapter 17 in just a moment, that passage really deals with the, uh, the Apostle Paul. And what Paul did, Paul went to Athens and he went there to debate, really, is what he actually did to talk to the people who were so religious there in Athens. You know, Athens, uh, there was the place of the philosophers. We're going to get to that in just a minute. And so uh, one of the things that I've come to notice here recently that has just been very disturbing with me is many people, many preachers who have known or supposed to have known Christ for many years are walking away from the faith. Many musicians are walking away from the faith. This has been going on for a long time and sometimes you're, you'll hear about certain people that you've known and that you love. And then also some of the preachers that I know who have not walked away from the faith but have embraced the culture and embraced what they call tolerance and emotionalism. Uh, many of the religionists of the day, this, this really bothers me because the Scripture uh, actually says that those people are apostates. The difference between an apostate and an heretic is a person, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 6, it says uh, in, in verse 4 and following, it talks about men in the culture or men who've come into the house of God and they've sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit, they've heard the words of truth, and then they walk away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the scripture says there remains no more sacrifice for sin. And the charismatics and other people take that passage and misinterpret it and say, well, see, you can lose your salvation. No, it says that there were people who came in who were religious. They came in, they heard the truth, and they walked away from it. And let me say this to you. If you walk away from the truth of Jesus Christ, you just walked away from the truth and the way of salvation. So religion will not help you. And for, as a matter of fact, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19, John tells us they went out from us because they weren't of us. And sometimes people will come and say, Brother Jerry, these folks left and they got this problem and that problem and that problem. And I says, well, here's the problem. Those folks are lost. I know those people. I've known them for years. And they're church hoppers. And they've, they're religious, but they have not found Jesus Christ as their Savior. The reason that people walk away from religion is because it does not fill their soul. It doesn't have anything of substance in their heart and their life. Now, you listen very carefully as we talk about the exclusive gospel today. I'm going to taxi before we get to this to the passage, but I'm going to give you some things that are very important for you to know and for you to understand, especially on a homecoming. Religion is man seeking God, and that is as old as Nimrod. It's as old as the Tower of Babel. And when you read that story in the Old Testament, you should understand that it's not just a story about some people building a tower. They said, we're going to build this and go into heaven. We're just going to walk into heaven. And religion is man trying to get into heaven his own way, and he disregards what God has said about it. Now, Christianity, on the other side, is not religion at all. It is a relationship, and Christianity is God seeking man. He came and looked for you and, saw, and sent you the Son of God. A.W. Tozer says, Most men play at religion as they play at games. Religion itself, being of all games, the, most, the one most universally played. Religion is as old as man. And it started even further back, even probably before the Tower of Babel. But we, we have a new Tower of Babel today. It's called artificial intelligence. And if you listen to your pastor, let me tell you, I believe that artificial intelligence will destroy itself. Many people who are not even Christians are worried to death about artificial intelligence. And we are told by the Scripture that God says He will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Religion here, most people really want religion uh, because the, the people want something that's not biblical. Most people want God religiously and not biblically. That way you can pick him up and set him down whenever you want to. And I want to say to you today, Christianity calls us to commitment. Commit, we are committed. This is a, a matter of surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ. And people who are religious can play the game. And they can talk the language of the church and quote scripture and do whatever they want to, but they never actually commit. 
uh, Arizona State University, uh, Prager University, asked the students there at Arizona State University about what their lives would be without religion. And they all uh, bought into religions. When they began to ask them if they were atheist or agnostic, if they were Hindus or Buddhist, whatever your religion is, guess what they found out about those folks? They know absolutely nothing about being an atheist. They know absolutely nothing about what an agnostic is. They don't know what a Buddhist or a Hindu is. All they know is they've created their own religion. And that's what the Tower of Babel was actually all about. If you're going to hold to an eternal belief, I want to caution you this morning. If you're watching by way of the internet this morning, if you're catching this podcast somewhere in another country, I want to say to you that if, if you're a religionist, if you're a religious person and you've rejected Christianity, you, you right well better know what you believe. Because when, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to judge mankind, you're going to be found wanting. And at least you need to know about your religion. I know about my Christianity, and I know exactly what it's all about. You see, what I'm talking about this morning is not just a little debate we want to have about religion and Christianity. This is about eternity. This is about whether you're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven or whether you're going to spend eternity in hell. Christianity has a playbook. Religion lets you set your own rules. And I want to tell you, if you're going to be a believer in Jesus Christ, you come and you surrender at the foot of the cross. And you admit that you need a Savior. And so there's a difference between religion and Christianity. And if you're going to go to heaven, my friend, there's four things you really got to talk about. And you got to answer these questions. And I'm going to give these to you real quickly. And then, then somebody's going to say, well, that's all fine, well, and good, Brother Jerry. But do you have some scripture to back it up? Well, then we're going to go to Acts chapter 17. And we're going to look at what Paul the Apostle Dale actually did there. And so let me just, rem- just give you a few things here. And I want to say to you that Christianity is the only thing that answers these questions. The first one is the question of origin. Where did all of this stuff come from? Where did you come from? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible, the word of God, the inspired scriptures is the only thing that tells us the answer to all these. Who is the creator? And if you say, well, we got a big bang theory that we're resting our eternity on. Well, let me just ask you a question. If there was a big bang, where'd the stuff come from to do the bang? Somebody had to create that. And if that's the truth, there is a God. And I want to ask you two questions. And when you're arguing with people about who created the universe and all these things, and whether they're agnostic, whether they're atheists, whether they believe in reincarnation, it doesn't matter. You can ask them two questions and blow their mind. The first one is water. Where did the water come from? Did you know that uh, scientists today still can't answer that question? You know what the best answer they have is? That meteors brought the salt water here for us. Boy, that's just brilliant. I want to tell you, high in the world, if you had enough meteors or asteroids or whatever it is that came here, if somebody was literally bringing it here in buckets, you'd never fill the ocean up. It's absolutely absurd. The next question I'd ask them is, okay, so the water got here. How'd the salt get in it? Where'd that come from? The second thing is design. Design proves a creator. How many of you men and women this morning have a watch on? Well, did that watch come from somewhere? Where did it come from? What do you call a guy who makes watches? A watchmaker. Some of you drove an automobile up here. No more can you tell me that all the parts fell out of the sky and then boom, they hit the ground, whoop, they turned into a car, and you jumped up and ran off in it. Wow. If I take this watch and just beat it and put all the pieces in and throw it and shake it up in a box, pull it out and say, look, I got a Rolex. Isn't that nice? Now, that's not going to happen. Did you know that these guys who are so brilliant that are telling you and, and uh, mixing people up about eternity will, will literally go from here to Mars And then they see a picture from uh, one of the rovers, and it looks like, oh, my goodness. It looks like there's something made out there with a right angle. And they get up there. You know what they're doing? They're looking for design. You know why? Because they'll tell you God didn't create this earth, but they're on Mars. They spent all that money going to Mars, and they're trying to find something that looks like some fella put two hands to it and welded it together on Mars. Well, bless their pointed head. I want to tell you. 
They're going halfway around the universe to find design in this world that we live in. All around you and me is filled with the designs of God. You are created in the design of God. Origin, where did it all come from? If there's a watch, there's a watchmaker. Now, two, condition. Well, how'd y'all get in the shape you're in? Something happened somewhere. Religion has no answer for why you're a sinner. Religion has no answer for why you like to lust and why you get... uh, hungry and your appetites get the best of you, where your pride came from, why you, why you would steal, why you would be ugly and say wrong things, and why do you always go to the flesh when you leave the presence of God? It's because you're fallen, and Adam and Eve fell, and the Scripture tells us about this. The fall of man describes all of this. Religion will not unite you with God. We are sinners. We are separated from God. We have to change our theological position In order to get to heaven, religion has no answer for the shape that we're in, the condition that we are in. Dr. Rogers puts this absolutely beautifully in his book, Kingdom Authority. And I want to say to you about your dominion. Salvation is all about your dominion. And you and I lost our dominion. It was given to Adam and Eve, and God said, take care of the garden. I'm giving you dominion over everything. But there's one portion of this you can't mess with, you can't touch it, you can't get near it, stay away from it. And Adam and Eve gloriously were given dominion. And you and I today don't have any dominion because it was legally lost. Now, when our dominion was legally lost you can, and, and let me just tell you, if you think that we have dominion over this world because we've conquered it, I want you to go home this afternoon after church, and I want you to pull the shower curtain back, and then I want you to say, Mold, in the name of Jesus, you're never coming back. And then you, you just put your Tilex up for about two months. And then go back, and then I want you to pull that shower curtain back. There it is. You don't have dominion. Some of us are sick this morning. Some of us have arthritis. You know why? Because you don't have dominion anymore. It was legally lost. And and you lost your dominion, and Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, and we're not allowed to go back. You want to go to heaven? How do you get there? The condition we're in gets fixed by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ righteously regained righteously regained because it was legally lost by a man a man had to get it back and that's why Jesus Christ can be the only exclusive way that you'll ever get to heaven because he is the only man who came as a God man who was able to get our dominion back There is no Buddha, there's no Confucius, there's no Hare Krishna. There is no one in all of history, in all of the universe, past, present, or who will come along the way who will be able to give us our dominion back. And I already have my dominion back. And so that leads us to number three. You know, we we need salvation. How do I fix my condition? This is the question of the ages. This is the question of the philosophers. This is why Paul went to Athens and confronted them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Paul, these people were so religious, they even had a a, a plaque to an unknown God. They were religious, but they were lost. And Paul went to share the gospel with them. And so people ask, what do you do with the Hindus? What do you do with the Muslims? What do you do with all these people? You tell them about Jesus. The gospel doesn't change for the Muslim. Gospel doesn't change for the Hindu. The gospel changes never because that's how we got saved. And so I sit there and just tell them about Jesus and watch them get under conviction. Sin has to be removed. If you're going to heaven, you have to be perfect and sinless. So, well, Brother Jerry, how am I going to be perfect and sinless in this body? Well, you can't. So everybody wants to identify something today. I'll tell you what you better identify with. You better identify with Jesus Christ as your Savior because here's what he did. Religion can't do this. Religion absolutely, positively has no deathless man 
taking the place of the dead man. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, it says there that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead people don't seek after God. Dead people don't talk. And we were dead spiritually, but we have a God-man who defeated death. You, you see, the problem that we all have, and every man has, whether he's a religionist or a Christian, is the grave is the great equalizer. And we're the only ones who understand that Jesus Christ has delivered us, has delivered us from death. Y'all all right? Religion, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because why? Because they're spiritually discerned. You see, a man is spiritually, has to dis- spiritually discern what I'm saying today. If you're lost and you're without Christ today, you can't understand what I'm saying. And the reason you can't understand what I'm saying is because you're lost. And, and you need spiritual discernment. You need the Holy Spirit to reveal this to you. You need to hear the truth. This is the keystone of Christianity, and it's called substitutionary atonement. Substitutionary atonement says that we have a deathless man who died for you who is a dead man. A sinless man becomes sin, so the sinner can become righteous. Religion does not have that. It can't do that. You know what religion talks about? Well, you have to be so good. you got to do a lot of good works. You will never do enough good works to change who you are in the flesh. You cannot do it. You need somebody else who has done it for you. And his name is Christ. God reconciles us. He reconciles the lost man so that he does not need to placate God. Here's what Dr. Gray used to do, and I have these bubblegum stickers I got in seminary. Still use them today, and when I share with people, I don't necessarily go right by it, but I, I do the same thing every, thing every time. When you're sharing with someone, you tell them salvation is needed. You tell them for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And if you're a Muslim, if you're a Hindu, if you're a Buddhist, I don't care what you are. If you're a Baptist and you've never received Jesus Christ, I want to tell you salvation is needed. Number two, salvation is provided. Jesus has provided the way to get to heaven. That's the difference in Christianity and religion. But the third thing is salvation accepted. To all who receive him, he gives the power to become children of God. Then the last one, number four, is destiny. See, n- nobody can tell you where we're going. They don't know what's going on after afterlife. We die at what's beyond the grave. Well, we've got some rock groups called Nirvana. We've got some other groups that talk about this bliss of just disappearing. Annihilationism. Well, we just everything's just gonna be annihilated and we're just gonna disappear into the ether somewhere. Well, I want to tell you I got a home in glory. And the Son of God said in in John 14, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if it's not true, I wouldn't have told you I'm going away, but I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to get you and I'm going to take you with me. Let not your heart be troubled. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. I'm the direction you should go in. I am the truth. I am your doctrine. I am the truth. And and he says, I'm the way and I'm the life. I am your destiny. Y'all put me in the ground one day. Don't y'all stand around the grave and boo-hoo and wail and carry on and say, Oh, we just hope Brother Jerry's in peace right now. You better say, I know exactly where that joker's at. He wasn't good for much of anything around here, but I want to tell you what, in Jesus Christ, he's in glory. Somebody give him glory. Amen? Now let's look at this passage right here. In the context where we are in Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to this pagan city. Paul is quite aware of the pagan culture. He's aware that Paul was a Hellenized Jew that knew Greek culture. Paul was educated. He was extremely intelligent. And this is not some illiterate, crazy, religious zealot. See, that's what they call us, emotional, religious zealots. You know who's emotional and zealots? They are. I know exactly what I believe, and I'm not emotional and you're not going to get this out of me this week, and then I'll preach something different next week, I'm solid sitting on the truth. And I'm banking my life on it. I'm staying right there with it. This is, this is the center of, you know, uh, 
Corinth was the kind of the center of a lot of things, but this was the center of Athenian culture. And the center were Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, uh, Epicurus, Zeno. Corinth had taken over as the political and commercial city of the world, but Athens was still the cultural and the philosophical and the intellectual place that was the center of the world. What I'm saying to you is when Paul goes here and he confronts these people, he's, he's, he's not confronting a bunch of rednecks, you all right? He's confronting the professors of the day. These people that hung out at the city gate and they talked about everything that came along, this was the educational system of the day. It's a cultural center. And this was the center of the the philosophical world. It was actually the place where the greatest university in all of the world, the the University of Georgia, was there. Go dogs! And then we come to verse number 16. That was a joke for some of y'all who didn't get that, so... Let's look at the confrontation. Let's look at verse number 16. So now you know what religion is. You know what Christianity is. Now watch what Paul does right here. Verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. This disturbed him, and it ought to disturb you. When you hear all of these things and what's going on, the first thing I heard about artificial intelligence, I said, that'll be great for a bunch of lazy preachers that they don't want to get in the Word now. They won't be worth shooting in six months. If you're a pastor listening to me and you're buying into all this stuff, listen to me. This is a word from God. You do your own work. AI doesn't know what's going on in this room this morning, but the Holy Spirit of God does, and I believe in sacred preparation. Paul was distressed in his heart. It means to infuriate. It's the same word that's used uh, when Paul and Barnabas got crossed with one another and they separated. Paul was hurt in his spirit. The city was full of idols, and Paul was upset about it. Look in verse number 17 and verse number 18. Paul was hurt, and, you know, and just being the kind of calm guy Paul was, he wouldn't go and argue with anybody. Well, yeah, he would. I got some folks that tell me, Brother you shouldn't have said that. Oh, you're going to make them mad. I hope I do make them mad. I hope they all get upset. Guess what? I'm not running for office. I don't have to compromise what I think. Y'all all right? I got one that's listening to me. Got a preacher friend that said, boy, I got a lot of good comments on my message today. I said, yeah, you keep thinking like that and you'll be sitting in the congregation somewhere. Because I'm not here to make anybody happy. I hope I can make you holy, include, including me. We have to answer to him, not the culture. So Paul reasoned with them in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who, wor- and with those who worship God. Did you catch that? And then in the marketplace, every day with those who happened to be there, Paul got the folks that were there. Then also some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers, they argued with him. And some said, what is this pseudo-intellectual trying to say? Your translation should probably say babbler. What's the babbler got to say? I don't know where Holman Christian got pseudo-intellectual from, but it's not a good translation. So what does Paul do? Paul goes to the economic, social, and political life, the center right there. And Paul, he he finds these Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans, these are philosophers that taught pleasure and avoidance of pain. Does that even sound familiar? I mean, what is it today? If it feels good, do it. Don't, if, it's, if it hurts you or if it hurts your feelings or if you don't like that, well, you just don't have to do it. Well, yes, you do. You have to learn life and keep pushing. Christianity answers that problem. What about the Stoics? Well, these are people that saw self-mastery as the virtue. Is that a religionist? That's a religionist. Well, I'm going to give and I'm going to serve and I'm going to go to confession three times a week and I'm going to pray through the rosary or I'm going to follow this guy who has new revelation or I'm going to send Benny Hinn $10,000. Well, I want to tell you something. You can keep sending all your money to Benny Hinn until you don't have any left and you still won't have pleased God. These are people, both groups tried to deal with life as religionists, and they failed. And then they come and they tell Paul, well, Paul, and this is what they'll say to you, that he's a babbler. 
The word is uh, sperma lagos. It's the word for sperm. And lagos is the word word with the word for seed. And what they're saying is Paul is a nitpicker. He's a seed picker. And the picture is of a bird. The, bird, the word came from a little bird. And if y'all got chickens, you know what this is. You can throw seeds out there on the ground. My daddy used to say this about hogs. He said you can take a, a handful of corn, you can throw it down in the mud, and a hog will eat it, and then you can butcher the hog, cut him open, and all the corn will be there, but not a grain of sand will be in his gut. He can fall back, and you see all that stuff running out of the hog's mouth? Well, he's getting rid of what he doesn't want. He's a seed picker. And it says a chicken will reach down in there and get exactly what he wants and not get what he doesn't want. There's not much they don't want, but they'll pick it out. They're seed pickers. Have you ever gone to battle with somebody? And I want to help you right here because some of you are going to share Jesus with people and they're going to disagree with you and they're going to argue with you and they're going to try to pick everything you say apart. That's what they were accusing Paul of. They say he's a little seed picker. He's a babbler. And if, Have you ever been picked on? Paul was outnumbered. Have you ever witnessed? You, you, you came right out in the office and your Christianity just slipped out right there and boy, you just got hammered all by everybody in the room. And then you're like, whoa, wait a minute. I want to tell you something. Don't feel bad. Just keep right on going. Uh, Paul made everybody mad. He went there on purpose. He went to the Areopagus. He went to see all of those people, and he stood toe-to-toe with them. Verse 19, we see where he goes to the Areopagus, and he does business with them. It, it says here in the text, after verse number 18, it says, this fellow right here, others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities, Because he was telling them the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. You see, that separates us from everybody else, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's what they said about poor Paul. They said, well, Paul, he's a sumbalo. They're throwing all these these, these, uh, thoughts together. And so the word philosophy actually comes from the Greek word philo, which means friend, and sophia, wisdom. A philosopher is supposed to be a friend of wisdom. And so here is, here is Paul. Paul has confronted them. Philosophy came to be the tenets and the doctrines of heathens and the Gentile thinkers. And so Paul goes, they said, well, here he is. They were accusing Paul of exactly what they were doing. The Greek word is xenos demonion, strange demons. They said, Paul has brought some stuff to us. They, they said, he's teaching us about foreign gods. He has some new doctrines. He's got some strange things, and he's nitpicking. He's putting all this together. He's just a babbler. Why were these strange things to him? Because they were religious people who served an empty religious system. And Paul said, no, sir, I have the answer. And if man's religion is so great, let me ask you this. Why has it not led the philosophers through the ages to the truth? 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. For since the wisdom of God, through that wisdom, the wisdom of the world, it it never came to know God. So I think I'm going to stick with my Christianity if you're all right with that because I feel like I have the truth. Now look, verse, verse number 22. He says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, and and by the way, if you'll look back at this text in verse number 17, he reasoned with the people who claimed to worship God. Whoa. And then he says, I see that you're extremely religious. The word religious right there is the word superstitious. Paul says, y'all are superstitious. In every respect, Paul had walked around. He said, good night. Uh, I think it was A.W. Tozer. He said, in Athens, there were as many gods as there were men. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar to the unknown God. Therefore, listen, come on. What you worship, he says, what you guys worship in ignorance This I proclaim to you. Paul is going to do exactly what I've said. 
He's going to challenge. You see, some of our young people go to college, and then the brilliant professor starts tearing their Christianity apart, and they feel like, I, can't, I don't have anything to say. Yes, you do have something to say. You actually have the only thing that you can say. And so Paul gives them this condemnation. Paul got a shot in on this group and these, these religionists and philosophers. And so, you know, Paul didn't go in there and say, well, I'm going to offend some people by this. He didn't worry about that. If you're not offending them, you're not shaking a tree. And so he says, you guys are just superstitious. And Paul, here's what Paul says to them. Paul starts preaching the word to them. And Paul says, this, this God you don't know. I'm going to show him to you, and I'm going to help you understand who this God actually is. And he, so he says he's transcendent. I'll tell you what, he's, he's, uh, he's not held in temples and shrines. You can make all the monuments you want to, but that's not where God lives. He's a cut above. Notice what Paul says. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, I'm going to proclaim this to you. Watch, 24. The God who made this world and everything in it, He is Lord of heaven and earth, and He does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. For one man, He has made everything, every nationality to live over the whole earth, and He has determined their appointed times and their boundaries of where they live he did, not, he, he did this so that they might seek God and perhaps that they might reach out and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and exist. And even some of your own poets have said, for we are His offspring, and being God's offspring then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Let's unpack that. There's some great words right here. Paul says, my God is transcendent. He's a cut above. He's not a name on a marker. He's, my God is in heaven. He is a God of spirit, and he is with us. He is immediate. He's very close to you. God is not a topic of conversation. He is not some intellectual stimulation. And that's what religion is. But when I begin to talk to you about our Savior, there are some deep-seated emotions in your heart that come out because you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know who He is. You understand Him. He is God. He is Savior who wants to be a part of your life. He's living. He's real. He's the author of life and the all of everything that is. Paul says, the God that I'm telling you about, see, they had a monument to the unknown God. Well, you may as well cover your bases just in case there is a real one out there, you know. Paul says, this unknown God you're talking about, I'm going to tell you who he is. And he's transcendent, and he's holy, and he lives in heaven. I know him. His spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. God did not save you and leave you to be on your own. That young college student in the classroom has not been left alone. The Holy Spirit lives in them, and they know that they have the truth. The Bible does not ever try to prove the existence of God. That means that if you cannot understand that there is a designer, that you are a, a, a proud, sinful, rebellious idiot. You're so smart, you completely miss the kingdom of God. A living God. Do you think that all these Christians who speak of the indwelling Holy Spirit and, and you're so smart, you have it all figured out. I want to tell you something. I cannot, I cannot breathe. I cannot wake up or go to sleep. I can't turn left or right without the Holy Spirit of God communing with me. Jesus said, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. You want some design? Look at the life of Jesus Christ. The Scripture goes so far as to say that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Paul says that what they worship in ignorance, he was going to show them. And let me introduce you to a man, the most religious man in all of Israel, who was empty 
the man Nicodemus. And he went to see Jesus Christ. You listen to me. These are, these are important words right here. And Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, you're the most religious man in Israel. You're the one who's teaching the other Pharisees about me, and you don't have a clue. And he says, listen, Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. Now listen, listen, the word perceive right there, the word perceive right there doesn't mean see with the eyes. It means to perceive with the heart. You listen to me, church, if you're here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, this is just a bunch of hogwash. Well, I'm going to tell you why it's hogwash to you. If you're watching by way of internet and you don't understand this, I want to tell you this. You have to exercise faith first. Jesus told Nicodemus, until you have faith, until you believe, he says, Nicodemus, until you do that, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You don't get to see the kingdom of heaven and then believe. He says, you have to believe you're the teacher of Israel and you don't understand because you've not crossed the line. You have to exercise your faith. Salvation is needed. Salvation is provided. The ball is in your court. It has to be accepted. It is the exclusive gospel. What a fool you are to keep running around looking for stuff that does not exist, that does not fulfill. Here is the most religious man probably in all of history, and Jesus put his business in the street. Jesus says to him, You must be born again. And until you're born again, everything that the preacher says and everything that your wife says who loves Jesus will be idiotic to you because you just don't understand. You just don't get it. And Jesus finishes this conversation, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. In Acts 17, 24, he says he's the ruler of the universe. In verse 25, he is the source of life. In verse 26, he created man. Every man came from Adam. Every man, every man, he says. Verse 28, Paul used their own philosophy against them. And Paul says, one of your own philosophers says that we're offsprings of God. We're children of God. Now, I would disagree with that statement in some some respects. But there's not a living soul on this planet who wasn't created by God. God is omniscient. He is omnipresent. And He is omnipotent. Now, look at verse number 29. Here is the culmination, verse 29 and verse 30. God's not gold, silver, and stone, an an image fashioned by human art and imagination. You, You know what our problem is today? We've created our own God. Paul addresses the problem, sin and idolatry, not recognizing who God is as the creator. That's your problem. That's why you can't get saved. You won't bow to the fact that man is too ignorant to do anything. We didn't create ourselves. We didn't create this world. God created it, and we have to yield to that. And you have this rebellious spirit in you, and you won't yield unto the Father. We are the offspring of God. We're not sticks. He's not. We, listen, if we're the offspring of God, we're living and breathing. We're, we're not stones and sticks. We're not the stars in the sky. We are not a graven image. The word for graven here means to be etched or carved. And notice, your, your Bible probably says, he is the, the device of man, the imagination of man. The word for imagination is the word for device. The King James puts it this way, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold and silver or stone or graven by art, And man's device. Did you catch that? By the imagination of man. Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Godhead is mentioned here. And it says that he was not created by the imaginations of man. The reason that you can't get born again is you just won't admit that Jesus is the Son of God. You've created your own religion. You've created your own way to heaven if there is a heaven. God, Paul says to these people, the the greatest, the smartest, the most intellectual philosophers of the day. And what does Paul say to them? You can't use your brain to create your own God. I'll tell you, that's good preaching. It's a good word. 
the context of one's thinking or reasoning. The King James uses the word device. We don't, listen, it's a statement of the day. You don't get to create God. He created you. You all right? Verse 30. He calls people to do what? Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people to repent. See, we let the world take that word away from us. We've let them take the importance of the word repentance away from us. And I want to tell you, here's what it is. It's a 180 degree turn. I say this with every bit of love and passion that I can for you. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, I want you to know that what you've heard about the judgment that is coming is true and it is real. But if you will turn and repent, God loves you so much. That's why he provided and fulfilled the needs of salvation. Because he cares for you. And you see, we feel silly by telling somebody, you just have to repent. What does it mean? You stop putting your trust and faith in religion and put it in Jesus Christ who will save you. Y'all all right? That's what this is for. Now listen, I heard this this week. This is not a quote. Didn't read it. Heard it with my own two ears from the man himself. Joel Osteen was bragging about all the different denominations, Hindus, Muslims, everyone coming to his church. Bragging about it. You know what he said? Somebody says, well, why would a Muslim come to your church? He says, they tell me that they feel better about themselves when they leave than when they came. Now, how long is that going to last? You see, this pastor loves you more than that. I know that there's a day coming. I know that there's judgment coming, and I want you to know the real truth, and I want you to know that now you can have all that happiness and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And you can identify with Him, and He will take care of the sin issue in your life. He will make you theologically, perfectly righteous in Christ. I'm not going to be a Joel Osteen. In verse 31, I know that many, uh, I know that many will do what the Athenians did. They're going to ridicule. Now watch this. Watch this. It goes on a little further because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man. In your scripture, that should be capitalized. All right? Who's the man? Jesus is the man. He's, he has appointed, he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, this just messed them. These jokers just got messed up because they just couldn't understand the resurrection. But God did it in history. It's a proven fact. It was there. And if they ever find one bone that belongs to Jesus Christ, we're doomed. They'll never find it. Never find it. Now, watch this. When they heard about the resurrection, some of them began to ridicule him but others said, we'd like to hear you on this subject again. Listen very carefully, listen very carefully, very, very carefully right here. I'm landing the plane. Hang on. You don't have tomorrow. Paul, this is all interesting, but talk to you about that tomorrow. Look at 18, verse 1. Look at 18, verse 1. After this... Paul left and went to Corinth. The Epicureans, the Stoics, didn't get a second conversation. The people sit in my truck when I'm sharing Jesus with them, just not ready. Had a best friend, came to hear me preach. I begged him, I begged him to receive Christ. Not ready. I'll do it later. Can't commit. Don't want to do it. He died in his 30s. I was fishing one day. We was bass fishing. Caught a big catfish. These guys came by us. Hey, man, you mind if I have that catfish? Yeah, you can have him. I don't want him. Take this catfish. Big old catfish. We went off down a little bit. Did a little more fishing. Came back by us. Leaned back in his chair and fell out. Had on some big old rubber boots. 
His name was Chris. And I can still hear his buddy. When he fell out of the boat, he threw his friend out. Trolling motor still running. Boat took off. That boy couldn't swim. It was one of the prettiest days I've ever seen in my life. We were trying to get to him as fast as we could to try to get him out of the water. And I thought people could beat the water for a minute before he went under. He went under in about five seconds. He was gone. It was dead quiet on the lake. Black Shoals Lake is where it's at. His hat floated to the top. I sat there devastated. I saw a man die right in front of me in five seconds. You see, you might not get the second chance. I've told you the truth today with everything that's within me. I've told you the truth. You might not get another occasion. Paul the Apostle might go to Corinth tomorrow, and you never get that second shot at the truth. And I want to tell you, with everything that's in me, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. There's no other way to heaven. You can listen to Oprah if you want to. Oprah says, oh, well, everybody's trying their, own, their best. They're on their own path. I want to tell you something. There is one path. I'm the way. There's your path. I, I'm the direction you should be going in. Jesus says, I am the truth. He didn't say I talk truth or speak truth or teach truth. He said, I am truth through and through. He's the truth. He's everything you need to believe about going to heaven and I'm the life. Pretty unique that little word life. There's, there's a few words in the New Testament for the word life. One of them is bios. We get our word biology from that. So when you come into this world, you born in myself in 1961 and when I go be a dash and then boop, Brother Jerry lived to 2050 or something, you know, 2050. So, praise the Lord. <laughs> a long life. That's my bios. But this word, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This word is zoe. It's the Greek word for the source of life. It's no accident that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and I'm the source of life. If you want to go to heaven, you got to get connected with the source of life. Now, this is what we call the invitation, and we're about to go have a great time together and fellowship and eat together and enjoy one of those company. We're going to have Christian fellowship together. And you said, Brother Jerry, it's a tough message today. No, it wasn't tough. This is, a, this is the hope of eternity this morning. Amen. You see, my folks that are saved in this room, they don't think it's a tough message. they like, sick them, boy, go. That's what they're thinking. I want to connect you <laughs> to my best friend, my Savior, my Lord. I promise you in Jesus' name, I am absolutely useless. I am worthless out of the hands of Jesus Christ. He's my all, my everything. I'll die for him. I'll live for him. I'll follow him. And no matter what he takes me through to make me more like Jesus, I'll take him. Amen. Would you take him today? Amen. This is your opportunity. This is, the, this is the invitation. When we start singing, you just come on and say, Brother Jerry, I've been playing the religious game. I want Jesus as my Savior today. Let's stand for all